Good afternoon or good morning and in this lecture we will be discussing our next solid dosage forms which is our tablets. So tablets are solid dosage forms usually prepared with the aid of suitable pharmaceutical excipients. They may vary in size, shape, weight, hardness, thickness, disintegration, and dissolution characteristics depending on their intended use and their method of manufacture. Tablets are primarily prepared by compression with a, lit with a limited number prepared by molding. So if you compare your tablets versus your capsules, capsules are prepared by filling gelatin shells. Tablets, on the other hand, are prepared by compressing granules or powders. We have different types of tablets based on their methods and their uses. But before we move on to the various types of tablet, let us first discuss the most basic or our compressed tablets. So our compressed tablets, these are tablets that are made via compression. Okay, Here is... In, in compressed tablets, granules are applied to a great amount of force to form the final tablet. And you require a, a different excipients to assist in, form, in forming your tablet. So first is your diluents and fillers. These are excipients that add bulk to your active ingredient to form the final tablet. Next, you have binders and adhesives. These are the glue that holds your tablets together. If you compress tablets without any binders or adhesives, you will form a tablet that will crumble. It's because nothing inside the tablet is holding the whole tablet together. So the role of binders and adhesives is to facilitate the uh, integrity of your tablets when handling. Next is your disintegrant and your disintegrating agents. These are used to facilitate disintegration and dissolution upon entry to your gastrointestinal tract. You also have your anti-adherents, your glidance lubricants or lubricating agents. These are more important in tablets than in capsules. Since you are compressing tablets using a punch and a die, if you do not lubricate your uh, tablet formulation correctly, there might be a chance that your tablet tends to stick towards your punches or stick towards your dice or stick to the walls of the dice. What this happens is it slows down production and you will have uh, defects in your formulation. And finally, you have your miscellaneous adjuncts such as colorants and flavorants. So the first type of your tablet is your multiply compressed tablet. When we say multiply compressed tablets, these are tablets that are formed when you are to compress twice. So for the first example, letter A, first you compress an inner tablet, then you add granules around the inner tablet, then compress again. What you will have is a bilayered tablet in which one uh, tablet primarily including uh, pri which, which would most likely contain a different drug from the outer com uh, outer layer in which you are physically separating the two drugs okay so that's uh, one method and the other one is when you fill and compress the first tablet and simply add the second fill on top of the uh, of your first compression so after the second compression you will end up with a bilayered tablet so an example of this is your alaxan fr which is yellow and orange and you also have your Neocep, which is white and green. So those tablets are impossible to be formed without compressing twice. Next is your sugar-coated tablets. So sugar-coated tablets are compressed tablets that may be coated with a colored or uncolored sugar layer. The coating is water-soluble and quickly dissolves after swallowing. The main purpose of your sugar coating is to protect the drug from the environment and also to mask ob objectionable taste and odor. So the sugar coat also enhances appearance of the compressed tablets, allowing you to imprint a manufacturer information. So you can actually see sometimes serial codes in your 
on your sugar-coated tablets. The main disadvantage of sugar-coated tablets is, number one, they add significant amount of bulk to your tablets. This increases weight and this increases transportation costs. And uh, this, another disadvantage is sugar coating is a lengthy process. So you add an extra step to your tablet compression and you need a certain amount of expertise in sugar coating tablets. Next is your film coated tablets. Your film coated tablets serve the same purpose as your sugar-coated tablets. However, the main advantage of sugar of your film-coated tablets is they produce a much smaller tablet. Since sugar-coated tablets tend to increase significantly in mass, film-coated tablets often produce negligible changes in tablet size. So film-coated tablets are actually almost indistinguishable from regular tablets unless you read the labels correctly. However, in terms of function, they act the same as sugar-coated tablets. Next, you have your gelatin-coated tablets. This is also similar to your film-coated and your sugar-coated tablets. The only difference is the coating material. So in gelatin-coated tablets, this is a rather new dosage form. Uh, instead of using film or sugar, you dip it in gelatin instead. One of the, advantage of, one of the advantages of gelatin is it's cheap, and it readily absorb it readily coats a tablet okay and it makes it a little bit smoother to swallow next is a unique dosage form in which it has a specific purpose you have your enteric coated tablets so your enteric coated tablets these are certain those uh, these are tablets in which it is coated with an enteric uh, coating which protects it from the stomach conditions so the entire coating is designed so that the tablet would withstand gastric conditions but would immediately dissolve or disintegrate in our intestinal conditions. This is employed in drugs that are usually destroyed in your stomach and can only be absorbed in your intestine. So an example of this is your erythromycin. So erythromycin is always enteric coated. It's because erythromycin is destroyed in stomach conditions or in acidic conditions. But once it arrives in your intestine, the coating starts to dissolve, the tablet tends to disintegrate, and it starts to be absorbed. Next is your buccal and your sublingual tablets. So these tablets are not intended to be swallowed. Buccal and sublingual tablets are intended to be dissolved in the oral cavity. Buccal meaning uh, in your uh, near the cheeks and sublingual meaning underneath the tongue. So these tablets are not to be ingested. These tablets, once dissolved in your mouth, are absorbable in the mouth itself. However, not all tablets can be formulated <clears throat> can be formulated as buccal and sublingual tablets. Certain drugs that has certain physicochemical properties can be absorbed from the oral mucosa, but not all drugs exhibit these properties. That is why you only have a few selection of buccal and your sublingual tablets. So examples of your buccal and sublingual tablets, you have your nitroglycerin, which is an anti-angina. You also have your fentanyl, which is an opioid drug. And you also have your uh, clonidine, which is also another antihypertensive drug. Okay, Please do make sure that once you instruct our patients to how to take our sublingual tablets is do not swallow. Next is your lozenges and your troches. Lozenges and troches are familiar to you. This is your strep cells and your drecanilium chloride. These are intended to be dissolved in the mouth. Primarily, these are drugs which has an agreeable taste and are primarily used to disinfect your oral cavity or to uh, suck on the process or your lozenges so that it can provide relief to sore throat. Next, you have your chewable tablets. Chewable tablets are specially formulated with mannitol to increase creaminess when chewed and to provide a pleasant taste. Chewable tablets are primarily designed for children and for adults who have difficulty in swallowing. 
However, similar to your buccal and your sublingual tablets, only certain drugs can be formulated as chewable tablets. Primarily, it's because of taste. So vitamins like ascorbic acid and multivitamins that uh, are formulated to have a pleasant taste can be formed into chewable tablets. Your antacids can also be formed as chewable tablets. Your cremel S is a chewable tablet. However, not all drugs can be uh, chewable. We have drugs that are, set, are very bitter that mannitol and sugar is insufficient to mask the taste. So you don't want to chew on a bitter drug. So instead of formulating it as a chewable tablet, make it a plain tablet. So you don't have to taste the drug so much. Okay? So that is the only downside of chewable tablets. Please take note that chewable tablets are not uh, are not or these are different from your rapidly dissolving tablets or your orally dissolving tablets. Next you have your effervescent tablets. Effervescent tablets are uh, effervescent granulated salts that were compressed into the tablet formulation. We have certain drugs that are uh, formulated as effervescent tablets like your flumosil or your acetylcysteine these are intended to uh, bubble when dipped or when dropped into a glass of water once you drop it into a glass of water it would start to release carbon dioxide causing the bubbling effect so the bubbling effect actually masks the bitter taste of the drug so if you ever tried flumosil either granules or tablets, once you place it in your glass of water, you have to finish the glass of water. So if you're going to instruct any patient to take flumosil or any effervescent granulated drug, make sure to instruct that you can use any amount of water provided that you will uh, completely drink all of the water. So if the patient dissolved it in a one liter container, they have to drink the whole one liter container to receive the whole drug. So ideally, uh, they should only take it with one glass of water. And please, 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 please never instruct the patient to swallow the tablets whole. What would happen if they swallow the tablets whole is the bubbling effect would take effect in their stomach. And how is this bad? It, was, it would cause bloating, it would cause burping, and in the worst possible case, it would cause vomiting. So this has happened before and don't be that person that causes this misunderstanding. So next is your historical tablets. So these are uh, not anymore. These, these drugs or these tablets are not very common in, in contemporary practice, but they are still important for our historical purposes. So first is your molded tablets. These are certain tablets such as tablet triturates that may be prepared by molding rather than compression. This is all uh, usually used in, co in compounding. So you have your tablet triturates. So your tablet triturates are usually cylindrical, molded, or compressed tablets containing small amounts of usually potent drugs. Uh, today, only a few tablet triturates of are commercially available and most of these are prepared by tablet compression. Since tablet triturates must be readily and completely soluble in water, only a minimal amount of pressure is applied to their manufacture. Next you have your hypodermic tablets. These are large tablets intended to be used by the physician to compound it to make a injection. Okay. So these are active ingredients in tablets that are crushed and uh, reconstituted into injections. These are not anymore used because doctors don't go house to house anymore. The main purpose of hypodermic tablets back in the day is, is so that doctors can carry a larger assortment of drugs in their medicine bag. And since doctors don't go towards patients anymore, patients go to the doctor, the need for hypodermic tablets has led it to phase out to phase out in the market next you have dispensing tablets so dispensing tablets are no longer in use these are usually large potent tablets intended for compounding pharmacists to serve as a stock of some sort so what the pharmacists will do is they will break apart the tablet weigh certain parts of the tablet 
and they compound it into a suitable dosage form, like a paper tablet, another tablet, or a capsule. The danger of this, since these are large potent drugs, is once if they if there is a wrong in dispensing, uh, it is very potent, so it might actually kill a person. However, uh, dispensing tablets are no longer in use. <clears throat> so we have immediate release tablets. When we say immediate release tablets, these are tablets designed to disintegrate and release their medication upon contact with your gastrointestinal tract. These are not special. These are can also be called plain tablets. So we call them IR or plain tablets. They have no special mechanisms at all. Next, you have your instantly disintegrating or dissolving tablets. So these are tablets that are different from chewables. You don't have to chew instantly disintegrating tablets. These tablets are designed so that when they are inserted in your oral cavity, they dissolve rapidly. They do not need to be ingested because it would not actually uh, be ingested. Once it is in your mouth, it, it dissolves rapidly, it becomes a solution, and it rapidly is absorbed. Okay. So an example of rapidly dissolving tablet is your Loratadine, particularly Claritin Reditabs. These are very fast dissolving tablets. You don't actually need water anymore for this. And you also have your antipsychotic drugs as your ODTs or your RDTs. The advantage of antipsychotic drugs as RDTs is if the patient is uncooperative, meaning they do not want to ingest drugs, you can just simply uh, force the patient to open their mouth and drop the tablet. Once it comes in contact with saliva, it would rapidly dissolve and you have already given the dose for the patient. Next, you have your vaginal tablets. So vaginal tablets are similar to vaginal suppositories. The only difference is these are prepared by compression, while your suppositories are usually prepared by melting or by molding. So vaginal tablets, these are tablets in, uh, intended to be inserted up in the vagina. Okay, usually these are antifungals, which are inserted up in the vagina using a special applicator. Okay, once they are in the vagina, these are designed to dissolve in vaginal secretions, melt, and uh, its effect would be local to the vagina. Primarily, these are used to control candida invasion. Okay, so you have compressed tablets. In compressed tablets, tablet diameters and shapes are determined by the die and the punches in compression. The less concave the punches, the flatter the tablets. Uh, conversely, the more concave the punches, the more convex the resulting tablets. <clears throat> Next is your quality standards and compendial requirements. So for tablet weight and USP weight variation test, these are tests performed to the a set or a batch of tablets to make sure that there is uniform distribution of the active ingredient in your batch of tablet compressions. In content uniformity, this is also similar to your tablet uh, <clears throat> weight variation test. However, in content your uniformity, you're going to assay. You're going to assay each uh, a sample of tablets, and you're going to determine if the range, if your batch of tablets are within range of the label claim. Okay, so there, for example, if you have a 100 milligram label claim, and the range is 85 percent to 115 percent, so the minimum should be 85 milligrams in a tablet and the maximum should be 115 milligrams in a tablet. Next, you have your tablet thickness. Tablet thickness is more of a quality control measure. If you have irregular shaped tablets or irregular thick, uh, you have irregular tablets which has different thicknesses, it might uh, mean that there is a problem in your manufacturing process since all your tablets should be uniform okay so tablet thickness is more of a in-process quality control measure to make sure that you're still producing uniform tablets 
Tablet hardness <coughs> is a property of tablets in which it is the resistance to uh, crumbling. So, tablets should be hard enough, meaning they don't crumble, in normal handling. But when they are ingested, they are uh, disintegrated properly. So, as a rule of thumb, at least 4 kilograms of force should be survived by your tablet. So, your tablet must survive at least 4 kilograms of force. Another rule for that is called the thumb rule. If you're able to crush a tablet with your bare thumb and index finger, that is a soft tablet. Okay? Please take note that tablet hardness is different from friability. So, friability is the outward uh, resistance of your drug. So, you might have a hard tablet, but if it is friable, meaning chips of your tablet uh, is ejected once your tablet hits certain surfaces. Next is tablet disintegration. This is similar to your this is similar to your uh, capsule disintegration test. So you place it in a basket rack apparatus which is undergone for 30 minutes under physiologic conditions. It should be completely disintegrated before 30 minutes. Uh, based on experience almost all uh, commercially available tablets usually last for 8 to 10 minutes in tablet disintegration. Your product fails if after 30 minutes you still have a whole tablet, meaning your tablet fails to disintegrate. Please take note of the definition of disintegration as there is a soft mass having a no, having no palpably firm core. Hindi nyo na nahahawakan yung uh, remains. Okay. Please take note that different tablets will require different disintegration parameters. So this is your SOTAX disintegration apparatus. We have this in our laboratory. Hopefully, you will be able to use it in quality control in the future. Next is your dissolution testing. The goal of in vitro dissolution testing is to provide a reasonable prediction of the correlation of your products in vivo bioavailability. This would be further discussed in your summer classes in your biopharmaceutics by me. But for now, simply know that the solution is to establish bioavailability. So you have different apparatuses for the solution testing. It's 1 to 6, but the most common is 1 and 2 for testing immediate release dosage forms. So you have the basket and you have the paddle. So the main process on how this works is you're going to place the tablet in the apparatus, run it for 30 minutes. Then after 30 minutes, you're going to get a fluid sample and assay how much of the drug is in the fluid. Okay. Ideally, all of the drug that was in your tablet should have been soluble in the water. And it should have been a part of the solution already. So next is your compressed tablet manufacturer. How is how are tablets made? Primarily, we have three methods of manufacture. You have wet granulation, you have dry granulation, and you have direct compression. So the most common is wet and dry, and direct compression is reserved for special drugs which has special physical characteristics. So they usually have the same types of excipients. And the most important part of the formulation is that there is free flow from the hopper towards other parts of the production line. You do not want a production line to stop at any time in the process just because your caps, uh, your raw materials become stuck. Okay? If your production line stops, you will have poor you will have poor products. You might have some tablets that are incorrectly sized or lacking in fill. <clears throat> so this is a general process of wet granulation. So we have the drug, you're going to grind the drug to the appropriate particle size. You're going to add your excipients, you're going to blend. 
once you have the blended mixture, you're going to add a liquid. The liquid will uh, form granules that you will with, which will agglomerate and you're going to pelletize. When we say pelletize, you're just going to have it pass through a sieve and you will have uniformly sized granules. After pelletizing, you're going to dry and screen again so that you have uniform granules. Once you have uniform granules, you're going to finally add the lubricant. And once you have the lubricant, you're going to compress, ending with a tablet. Now, the key difference between wet granulation and dry granulation is the presence of liquids and drying. So in wet granulation, you're going to use liquids to form the mass for granulating. For dry granulation, on the other hand, <clears throat> you simply grind the drug, add your excipients, blend and pelletize directly pelletizing without any liquid involved so once you have your pellets either by slugging or by roller compaction you're going to crush and screen after crushing you would end up with irregularly shaped granules these are formed by compression instead of adhesion by water so if you screen them you would now have uniform granules and similar to the last part of your wet, granul wet granulation method, you will blend with your lubricant and direct compress. And you will have your tablet. Direct compression is only suitable for drugs which has a, a, a property that allows it to be directly compressed without forming the granules. So examples of this is your potassium chloride. So the drug will be ground. After it is ground, you're going to add your uh, excipients, blend, and directly compress. Okay, You don't need to granulate because the property of the drug allows it to self-adhere to each other. So these are the different steps of wet granulation, which I have just discussed. Please read this on your own. Okay, please take note that we have different excipients like fillers. The fillers or your diluents make up the bulk of your compression of your compressed tablets. This includes lactose, microcrystalline cellulose, starch, powdered sucrose, and calcium phosphate. Next, you have your disintegrating agents which help your, your tablet disintegrate once it is exposed to water. So you have the various samples on the screen and cross caramelose are preferred cross caramelose and sodium starch glycolate okay next is preparing the damp mass you can uh, use adhering agents or binding agents like liquid corn starch glucose solution molasses methyl cellulose carboxymethyl cellulose and microcrystalline cellulose usually the cheapest would be corn starch If you're going to screen the damp mass into pellets, you're going to pass it through a sieve. Please take note that after you have pelletized your uh, granules, you have to spread it evenly so that it also dries evenly. If you don't uh, dry it evenly, you will have some wet parts that would actually affect uh, the final product of your tablets. So drying. If you want to size your granules, you have to have a uniform size. So you might want to pass it through a sieve again to have a uniform granule size. If you have irregular granule sizes, what would happen is you would have air spaces in your, inside your tablet after compression. And these air spaces are points of weaknesses. So it would actually cause your tablets to crumble under pressure. Okay. So after granulating, you're going to add lubricant. So these are the main method or the main purpose of your lubricant. So they improve flow, prevent adhesion, reduce friction, and they finally give a sheen to the finished tablet. So uh, lubricants, glidants, anti-adherents, these are usually all the same chemicals. So you have your stearates. 
So you have your magnesium stearate, calcium stearate, stearic acid, talc, sodium laurel fumarate, and the most common is your magnesium stearate. You also have some all-in-one granulation methods, primarily using the fluid bed granulator. So this is the fluid bed granulator. So instead of undergoing the whole process of drying, granulating, wetting, you start off with uh, the active ingredient and it would be blown by air upwards. Once it reaches the parts of the sprayers, sprayers will spray the diluent in liquid form towards your drugs or your drug particles. Eventually, they will thicken. Once they thicken enough, they would become heavy so that the air cannot push them up and they would eventually sink. And you will have granules that way. So you have next is your dry granulation. So the main difference between your dry granulation and when your wet granulation is dry granulation does not have any liquid. So therefore, there is no drying involved. So there are two primary methods for dry granulation. You have slugging in which you are similarly compressing granules to make large slugs. These slugs are broken up by hand or by use of a grinder or a mill. Another one is roller compaction. Roller compaction is when you uh, place <clears throat> the drugs in a conveyor belt. Example, these are the drug particles. And they are applied a great number of force in which they form a thin sheet of granules. So this sheet of granules are then broken up by a uh, grinder or a by hand and you will form uniform granules. Okay? Roller compaction is often preferred to slugging because of the simplicity of how it is made instead of slugging in which you need to compress. So this is uh, tableting of granulation. Once uh, your granules have all been formed, simply put, you have different types, or you have different parts of the granule of the tableting process. You have your upper punch, you have your lower punch, you have your cavity or the dye. What happens is first, the granules will be placed in the cavity. Then your upper punch will press down on the cavity, compressing the granules and forming the tablet. Once you have formed the tablet, the lower punch will now push out the tablet, ejecting it from the dye. Once it is ejected, it would now be moved to the next step of the process. So usually this is the process of a greatest amount of error. If you have uh, formulation errors in which you, you did not properly make or your formula was wrong, you would end up with faulty tablets. You would end up with tablets that are too, too soft, too sticky, too large. And at most, the worst thing that could happen is your tablets might not form at all. You are able to compress, but the tablet does not hold its shape. For direct compression, it only applies for certain granular chemicals like potassium chloride. This possesses free-flowing and cohesive properties that enable them to be compressed directly in a tablet machine without any need of granulation. So next you have the process of tablet coating. So tablets are coated for a number of reasons that, are, that has been discussed earlier. You have two types. You have your uh, sugar coating and you have your film coating. For sugar coating tablets, these are the steps of sugar coating. Waterproofing and sealing, subcoating, smoothing, finishing, and polishing. So for waterproofing and sealing, tablets containing components that are adversely affected by moisture must be waterproofed first. You can use shellac or any polymer that are applied to the compressed tablets. Then you perform subcoating. Subcoating is where most of the mass 
is added. Okay, so in this step, three to five subcoats of a sugar-based syrup is applied. So you're going to spray the sugar solution or the sugar syrup solution on your tablets and it would form the subcoat. After it is subcoated, you are going to add additional coatings of syrup and you're going to smooth the coatings either by buffing the outermost layer. And finally, you have your finishing and coloring. So to, uh, to attain final smoothness, several coats of a thin syrup containing the desired colorant is applied in the usual manner and they are buffed. Okay, so in the last step is where the color is added. Next, you have your film coated tablets. So in the film coating process, you place a thin skin tight coating of a plastic like material over the compressed tablets and you are producing tablets which has essentially the same weight because film coating is so thin it actually produces negligible additions in weight so we have different excipients to film coating you have the film former that is the primary material of your film it could be cellulose acetate phthalate you have your alloying substance so your alloying substance provides water solubility and permeability it's because if you uh, uh, form a film that is not soluble to water, that tablet will not dissolve. Okay? Your stomach and your GI tract is mostly water. If it is insoluble to water, you will excrete it as a solid tablet. And finally, you have a plasticizer. So the plasticizer's role is to simply is to simply add flexibility to your, to your film so that it doesn't crack. You also have surfactants to increase spreadability of the film. You have your opacants and colorants to give a color to the film if needed. You also have your sweeteners, flavor, and aromas. And you have your glossan to provide luster. You also need a volatile substance so that your film is easily spread across your tablet. And finally, you have your enteric coatings. So enteric coatings are uh, primarily a type of film coating in which it renders your tablet resistant to acidic pH. And these are designed to dissolve at pHs 4.8 and greater. So some materials used in enter enteric coating as your shellac. Hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose phthalate, polyvinyl acetate phthalate, diethyl phthalate, and cellulose acetate phthalate. And lastly, you must be familiar with the different types of tablet defects. So these are the most common tablet defects. You have your sticking, you have your picking. So stick and picking is primarily due to adhesion. When you say sticking, it is the adhesion of the material to the dye wall. Okay? So meaning it does not uh, eject properly. Picking is when your tablet uh, adheres to the punches. So uh, once your tablet goes up, uh, once your punch goes up, the tablet also goes with your punch. So that's uh, picking. Lamination is separation of the tablet into two or more layers due to air entrapment in the granules. This is usually due to irregular uh, granule sizes. You have your cracking, small fine cracks observed on the upper and lower central surface of the tablets. You have your chipping. Chipping is when uh, shards of your tablet is broken off. You have your capping. It is separation of the top or bottom tablet due to air entrapment. And you have your mottling. Mottling is due to an equal distribution of color. Most of the time, mottling is caused by uh, uneven heating or uneven drying or uneven application of colorant. 